under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if we can have a moment of silence to honor those who serve our country, enforce our laws, and respond to emergencies. Most Brockporters know at least something about our most famous predecessors, such as Heil Brockway, James Seymour, Fanny Barrier Williams, and Mary Jane Holmes. But, another, uh, but a number of others are worthy of our notice as well. In the next few meetings, my historical moments will introduce a few of them to you. Two men are the object of our attention this evening. The first is Charles B. Greenow. He was born in Vermont in 1824 and came to Brockport as a child. His father, Ezra, had a wagon shop on Clinton Street. He began his career as an agent for a canal transportation company and then served as general ticket agent for the Erie Railroad and later the New York Central Railroad in New York City. Still later, he became chief engineer and general manager of the Bleecker Street and Fulton Ferry Railroad Company and oversaw the construction of its streetcar lines. He had some sort of dispute with that company and hearing of attempts to build tramways in Brazil, re relocated to Rio de Janeiro in 1866, where he built the Botanical Garden Railroad, the first major tramway in Latin America, which became the model for many others. He also was a consultant for a streetcar line in Bordeaux, France. While in Rio, Greenow became acquainted with Richard Cutts Sh <coughs> Shannon, the second of our notable Sprockporters this evening. Shannon was a loyal alumnus of Colby College in Maine, which gave him an honorary degree and named for him a building that he had funded. Shannon had a distinguished record as a Union Army officer in the Civil War and was appointed Secretary of the United States Legation in Rio in 1871. He succeeded Greenow as CEO of the Botanical Tramline in 1876. <coughs> Shannon returned to the United States in 1883, studied law and entered practice in New York City in 1886. From 1891 to 1893, he was minister to three Central American countries. He returned to the U.S. and was elected to the House of Representatives in 1894 and re-elected in 1896. He declined re-election in 1898 and resumed law practice until retiring in 1903. Meanwhile, Greenow, Charles B. Greenow, the first of our notables, had died in Paris in 1880 at the age of 56. In 1887, his widow, Martha, married Shannon in London in a fancy high society wedding. When Shannon retired, the couple moved to Brockport and took possession of the house on the northwest corner of Main and College Streets, the Roxbury, that had been built by Luther Gordon for Dr. Ralph Thatcher and had been owned by the Greenhouse since the early 1870s. Shannon died in Brockport in 1920 and is buried in Lakeview Cemetery. In 1881, Greenhouse's mother donated a stained glass window to the St. Luke's Episcopal Church in memory of her son. In the late 1920s, when the parish hall was added to the First Baptist Church, the large reception hall was named in memory of Shannon, who had been a generous supporter of the church. Very interesting as always. Thank you. We have a couple of uh, certificates and proclamations um, tonight. Oh, the recipient of the first one has just entered. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're doing this already. Yeah. <laughs> This is the annual proclamation that the village um, makes in honor of um, Arbor Day. And I will simply read it. Uh, Whereas natural areas, trees, and landscapes provide not only community beautification, but also economic and environmental benefits. And whereas trees provide many benefits to the community, community including air purification, wind breaks, 
noise reduction, shade, and energy savings, and whereas planting and trees and maintaining older trees provides an opportunity for community interaction, volunteerism, economic development, and environmental conservation, and whereas our efforts to improve the environment benefit present and future generations, and whereas Arbor Day in the village of Brockport is held each April. Be it therefore resolved, I, Margaret B. Blackman, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor, and on behalf of the village board, do hereby tender this proclamation on March 16, 2015, and do hereby proclaim Friday, April 24, 2015, as Arbor Day in the village of Brockport, and you'll hear more about that later, and encourage all of our citizens to participate in appropriate activities and to take advantage of the benefits of the parks and other natural areas in our community, in witness whereof we have set our hands and caused the corporate seal of the village of Brockport to be affixed. And it's signed by myself and all the members of the board. Here you are. Thank you. Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And the second uh, certificate is to Art Appleby in regards to the crop walk in Brockport, which takes place every year. Whereas on Sunday afternoon, May 3rd, many area residents will walk with the world in the 33rd annual crop walk in Brockport. And whereas this is done to help provide seeds, tools, water resources, vocational and literacy training, and other self-help skills needed overseas through the church world service, and whereas women, men, and children throughout the world must walk long distances every day to get water, food, and shelter in order to survive, and whereas 25% of crop walk funds raised will assist hungry people right in our own area through the Brockport Food Shelf, and whereas there have been 32 walks between 1983 and 2014, which have raised the total of over $240,000 of which more than 60,000, 25%, has stayed in Brockport. And whereas there continues to be a growing number of people who need assistance at our local food pantry and a need for education regarding poverty and hunger in the world, be it therefore resolved, I, Margaret B. Blackman, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor and on behalf of the village board, do hereby tender this proclamation and do hereby proclaim May Sunday, May 3rd, 2015, as Crop Walk Day in the village of Brockport, and encourage all of our citizens to walk with the world by walking, sponsoring a walker, or making a gift to crop. In witness whereof we have hereto set our hands and caused the corporate seal of the village of Brockport to be affixed the 16th day of March in 2015. And we've all Thank you. Thank you. Art. Public comment, is there, if there's anyone for public comment, there's a limit of five minutes per person. State your name and address for the record, speak directly to the entire board. And if you have a prepared statement, share it with the village clerk. Is there anybody for public comment? Okay. Uh, we have several guests tonight. Uh, first of all, Art Appleby again, president of BISCO, and this is regarding the art festival and the street closure. Um, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to read the letter? Or sure. The yeah, go ahead, read it for everybody. So. Okay. Um, the following is a, is a letter that I wrote to trustees on behalf of BISCO. Um, this GOAT, the creators and sponsors of the Brockport Arts Festival, are asking for board consideration and action on our request to have the 21st Brockport Arts Festival on Main Street. With Main Street closed to traffic from State Street to the Adams Street Park Fair intersection from 7 p.m. August 7 to 7 p.m. August 9, 2015. In addition, all streets entering Main from State to College will be closed one block east and one block west of their respective intersections with Main to all but local traffic, since the festival will be shorter than in the past. We expect that we will need to use about half the entire length of College Street, as well as about the first 400 feet of South Street for vendors. All of the vendors will be placed on the curbs this year, enabling patrons and emergency vehicles, if absolutely necessary, to use the center of the street. We will make arrangements with Domino's and Sun King that allow them access. In addition, this bill requests exclusive authority over events and, or other non-festival related uses that may be planned on the above streets. 
and that, furthermore, this be made clear by the village to any groups potentially affected, such as merchants, churches, etc. The goal of the change in location is both to avoid any lingering problems that the Park Avenue Bridge Repair may cause and to give village merchants <coughs> full use of Main Street in the business district. The festival will continue to use the canal for its duck derby. We request that this topic be addressed at the March 16th Village Board meeting. Art Appleby, fiscal president and 2014 festival chair, will attend the meeting to address any questions. Bisco would like to thank the mayor and trustees for their support. We truly feel as though we have enjoyed substantial village support as we move forward with this complex project for the 21st festival. As always, members of Bisco will contact the police department, DPW, the fire district, and ambulance corps. It is greatly to the benefit of the community to provide the best possible experience for our participants and our attendees. Thank you, Mark. Um, any members of the board, do you have any questions for Art? I have one. What if, if let, let's assume that, that everything goes well and the Park Avenue Bridge gets repaired as it's supposed to by the end of March? Then would you go with the original plan, or are you going to do this anyway? We're kind of thinking of doing it anyway. Um, okay. There's some dialogue that hasn't happened yet. That we, we intend to speak with the uh, Merchants Association and the Chamber of Commerce okay. to have them on board with, with this plan and uh, you know, see what they have to say. Um, we're, we're developing the maps right now, so we really don't know where things are going to go yet. Okay. But, um, because of some conflicts that, that we've had in, in the business district, mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to make it narrower. Um, it's, it's awkward to put the, merchant, the uh, vendors on the curbs because of the, the stores. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is probably a good move. Okay. Any any questions from any of the department heads or concerns? Is the uh, when you speak of Main and State, are you talking about State Street will still be open or will we close it? State Street will be open. Okay. Everything from there south will be closed. Okay. Obviously, we we may elect to close it in a different manner, but I would expect that that would be left up to us for purposes of public safety. I mean, you will have whatever you're requesting, presuming the board approves it, but we may find it safer to close Main Street north of that area versus allowing everything to come up to State Street. Okay, well, we'll but, have to But that wouldn't that. affect, yeah. you know, in other words, you're going to have everything you're asking for, but from our perspective, rather than bringing traffic all the way up to State Street, we may bring it down Market, we may bring it down Clinton, or maybe even north of the bridge, but I would like to discuss that with the board and my liaisons uh, as, as we move closer. Yeah, sure. Okay. Art, is there any idea what there will be for access for emergency vehicles, what the, what the uh, width down the center, the proposed width down the center would be? Um, Main Street is about I want to say 50 feet wide down in that neck, neck of the woods. Um, not quite, maybe 45. So you take away 10 feet on each side. There's, oh. there's, there's okay, so that's 20. the proposal is 10 feet on each side yeah, for the vendors? that's what the booths are 10 by 10. Okay. So um, give yourself about 20 to 25 feet in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Which will, I hope, be filled with people. <laughs> yeah. So. Any other? Do I then have a, a motion from the board to um, accept the, the, I guess I would say the layout that as Art has proposed it in this letter to the board? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Got it. And just, yeah. just to remind, there, this bill has to apply to the DOT because Main Street's oh, yeah. a New York State work road, so we'll do the supporting letter. <coughs> the village is fine with whatever application you're making for this. Okay. So I'll get something yes, to you too. That has to go with the application to deal. I'll get something to go with that for you. Yeah. Okay. And we also have next up is the market managers, Ruth Ann Troika and Charlene Bills. And this is wonderful to be hearing about the farmer's <laughs> market, which is on the horizon. Getting close. The snow goes away. Um, 
This year it'll be June 21st to October 25th, Father's Day to last Sunday of October as usual. Keeping the hours 8 to 1, um, Market Street like always. Uh, we are in need of ordering new signs because the two signs we've had have been found new homes by somebody. Um, they were movable signs and lost two last year. So with some of our money left in our budget, we'd like to purchase a couple new signs. And we're also asking the board if there's any place we could get like permanent signage someplace to prevent our waste of money for signs all the time when they find new homes. What do you what do you mean by a, a uh, permanent a permanent sign that would hang from somewhere? Or whether it would hang from somewhere, or maybe like where it says Village of Brockport, you know, add on a wooden thing, farmers market, Sundays, you know, with the information. So it could be added on and then taken down when the season was season over with. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, anything that anybody could come up with is type of a permanent type sign, just because it's kind of you know wasting money year after year buying new ones. What do you? I'm trying to. What do you normally have like sandwich board signs? Um, that you we had the metal. Steak ones that you sit, sit in the ground with the mm -hmm. sign inside of it, and then we would just move them around <coughs> locations mm -hmm. randomly, stake them in the ground. And then one week one showed up, a month later the other one was gone too. So mm -hmm. uh, we do have a sandwich board one that we put out by the market. Yeah. Um, when the permanent or the, the quote unquote or the, the signs that you put up mm -hmm. that disappeared, right. what days were those up? Were those up during those the week? Those were only on Sunday. Well, we, we did leave them up during yeah. the week. Yeah, uh -huh. we did try to leave them up during the during week. During the season? During the season, yeah. Just to save time and trouble running back and forth through front court and figuring mm -hmm. maybe if we leave it up all week, you know, be a constant reminder. Right, mm -hmm. which seemed to help because the market is picking up in business with more people. Yeah. So. Where do you think those signs should go? Where would you like to see it? Some place where it's very visible, you know, like, I, I'm not really sure. Um, is there any way that we could, like, maybe put a sign up in the circle up there or maybe on the corner where Ryan's was? Um, your sign down by the railroad bridge, right? Yeah, Add maybe a piece on that. Mm -hmm. um, we're open to suggestions. Just, you know, we just don't want to keep throwing money out for right. signs. They might work in this place. I don't know if we, I don't think we can put signs in the circle itself. I don't think DOT is in favor right. of that because it's considered a distraction, a distraction to the right. drivers. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a sign by by Ryan's Big M. Is there not a rock board? I think so. Rock board yes. sign Some, could some be place around there. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, added to the bottom. Even like one in each end of town. Right. Right. Yeah. right. The one, the one by Ryan's is blocked on the bottom, but. By, by Shrubber, yeah, they trimmed it once. <coughs> time ago. Well, that was Bob Ryan that trimmed it. So that was a lot of stuff for it or something close by there. Yeah, I don't see why we couldn't do something like that if we could hang it from some permanent, you know, yeah. permanent right. thing that's already there. Yeah. So yeah, we each end of the village. Each end of the village. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's all. That sounds like a good deal. And then we would like to try to get them up, you know, like maybe a week or so before market season starts mm -hmm. to start planting that seed in people again. Okay. Um, and then banners, you were also... Banners, as you suggested last year, the old brown ones, they were ripped and faded and <coughs> kind of ugly. Mm -hmm. Wrong times on them. Um, so that would be really nice to get new banners with the correct times on them, something mm -hmm. really colorful that, you know, will get people's attention instead of kind of brown that blends in with yeah. everything. Um, Could you get us some prices on on those those things? I uh, would be glad to. Um, I would need like the sizes that go on the poles. Do we still have the old brown ones? Because no. we got them from here. Yeah, no, they got trashed because they were all... Oh, okay. Oh, so you don't even have them anymore? No, we don't even have them anymore because they were just... Yeah. Well, we've got other polls. banners that are the right, the right. right size. Yes. Yes. So, so we can get information on who to contact for our yeah. pricing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. talk to Harry. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably have our emails, right? Yep. Yeah. Get a hold of us. And, and could they talk to you, too, about permanent signs, the kind of, the kind of, the kind of signs and, and sure. you know, where they, might, where they might go? That sounds good. Yeah, I mean, I think... I can't speak for the, the entire board, but certainly... I, I 
would think that we would all be in favor of promoting the market as, oh, yeah. as much as possible. Do we need a motion? Can they just do that? Do we need a motion, Leslie? <clears throat> well, typically you would, you'd have prices and everything. How much are we talking? You know, you say there's money left in the budget. Yeah, I believe there's like 700 something left in the budget. Um, I mean, if the, conceptually the board yeah. says yes, we're in favor of new signage, come back with prices or? Yeah, why don't, let's, I mean, I think we're all okay. in favor. Why don't you come, come back to us with prices okay. for, for that? Yeah. And, uh, okay. you know, we can, we can go from there. Sounds good. Um, the last one um, is just something that we wanted to have some input on. Um, traditionally, Charmaine and I have, to set up the market, we've gotten to uh, Market Street at 6 a.m. Um, and set up the barricades. A lot of times the police department has already done that for us, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Um, we don't meet together, we, we alternate, just so we're not both up every single Sunday morning at five o'clock um, to do that. Is there anything, I know, with, I don't know why, how, or when the police department does it or doesn't do it. Is there any way we could perhaps be notified if it's done, or is there anything in, in place about that, or is it just kind of a hit and miss thing? Well, I, I think maybe what I could say is we'll, we'll put something in place and we'll make sure it's done every every Sunday. Oh, that I would can't be awesome. See, oh. I, well, I, all you need to do is let me know, and, and then we would have changed that. But I certainly can't see you ladies coming in for the purposes of putting up barricades. So. Uh, it, when we get closer to this, if one of you can get in touch with me, okay. we'll just make sure it's done. And uh, I think the DPW drops the barricades on Friday. 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 Right. Right. right, so the barricades right. are there. Right, they're all there. Right. We'll take care of it. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Awesome. But would you please just yeah. remind me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not a problem. Thank you. That would be and great. Oh, no, no problem. I'm sorry we didn't do this sooner because there's no reason for you to. Well, that's yeah. okay. I never really minded it. Being a farmer all my life, used to early mornings, but. Last year there was a couple of sketchy guys walking around that was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and they didn't offer to help. Right. And then <laughs> <they're like, laughs> we're like, yeah. <laughs> maybe we should come together. <laughs> so that's great news. Great. 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 Thank you. And I guess that's really about it. Okay. Um, Thank you. We are very much looking forward to the market opening. So <laughs> Gregory's Bakery will be back. Great. I was going to say, Gregory's Bakery's going to be back. Um, we had, I got a form from Casa Largo Winery this year. Mm -hmm. So we may have two wineries at Thousand good, Island Winery. Good, good airport winery. <laughs> so, you know, so no, you're not recommending any changes to the rules and regulations? No, yeah. no, rules and regulations. And contracts, so I could get those prepared yeah, for you? Yes, get them prepared and okay. get them out beginning of April, because I've had some of the vendors say, hey, we've gotten all the other contracts for yours. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I'm clear the fact that it's up to the board if you wish to go ahead and renew uh, reappoint these ladies as farmers market managers now, or if you wish to wait till the budget is passed. It's totally up to you. I think we need them. Yeah. Uh, so I'll make the motion to reappoint um, Charlene and Ruthann as market managers. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You're reappointed. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. It's fun. It's <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Maddie Smith of Food Link. Hello, thank you for the intro there. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you Leslie for inviting me to the village board meeting. I am uh, taking over someone at Food Link. Uh, his name was Jerome and he talked to a few people at the Sweden Senior Center down here about bringing our curbside market truck uh, to the Senior Center. So the curbside market truck is a farmer's market on wheels. Um, that brings fresh local fruits and vegetables and affordable fruits and vegetables to underserved areas. Um, and so the reason I'm here today is to talk to everyone here about the possibility of doing that and having a stop at the senior center and to communicate with the farmer's market managers about our philosophy that we aren't trying to trot on any other farmer's markets here. So that's my goal is two pronged here. Um, and I don't know what sort of formal process it is to apply to be part of the um, farmer's market here and to have ourselves set up at the Sweden Center, uh, but I just want to know that before we start developing our schedule, which we're doing right now. So, Do they need a vendor's license through the 
microphone or something? Yeah, I think, David, did we determine it would be a peddling and soliciting yes. permit? Yes, um, it's not on village property, it's on the town of Sweden property, okay. if it's at the Sweden Senior Center. So yeah. they probably would want to co sign the right. other application to use that. Okay. You know, um, but Mandy wanted to kind of get a feel for mm -hmm. should she pursue it? Um, and it wouldn't be the same days as the our no, market. Yeah. Or? So our market it runs Monday through Friday, um, and we try to go on a day that's going to be the farthest away from the Sunday uh, Sunday market, right? Mm -hmm. Market. So we're looking at um, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday to be in um, Brockport. And be one day, one day a week. One day a week, and just an hour at a time. Um, we also have Oak Orchard Health in Brockport. We went there last year, mm -hmm. and we're planning on doing that again. Oh, so you'll be there as well as yeah yeah oh, great okay. is it just produce that you do yeah we do produce eggs and sometimes nuts oh, wow. yeah how does may i ask yep. a um is there do you charge for these or is it yeah is it yep so it's a market-based program um but we purchase wholesale from all sorts of farmers locally and then are able to sell things very cheaply yeah. out so um, like eight potatoes for a dollar, a dollar twenty-five for a dozen eggs, prices like that. Um, and the market accepts cash and debit, and then WIC farmers market checks and EBT. Do you guys take EBT and SNAP? Yeah. Um, that was going to be asked. Huh. Who did you Okay. Oh, so you buy the stuff and then you resell it. Yeah. Okay, would this be to only senior citizens? No, anyone can shop on the market. Um, like I said, the you know focus of the market is generally underserved communities, so if we're going to the senior center, the idea is that um, maybe these people don't have access to the farmer's market for physical, financial, other sort of transportation reasons, um, and so reaching a different sort of market there. Is there any chance, I know that the um, Brockport Food Shelf is open on Thursdays, okay. as you're probably maybe aware of that too. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if it could somehow be worked in um, co cooperation with their times. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't see why not, and that's a great suggestion. Do you know what the foot traffic is like at the food shelf? I think I had given you the contact information, but if I didn't, I'll email you. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. You might have, but yep. there was a lot of stuff going on there. But that's, that's a good idea the same day. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I know if you work there, are a lot of people mm -hmm. like the fresh yeah. vegetables and fruits as well. And, uh, and many of them have to get a ride, too, mm -hmm. to get their um, okay. food. And being that this is right down the street, it right. would be nice to coordinate mm -hmm. yeah. it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll make sure you get it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Is, it okay. is it a monthly program? When does it yep, so the schedule is um, it's a preset schedule. Last year we went to 50 sites a week, and it was a um, one truck hit 25 sites per week, the other truck hit 25. So we have a daily schedule. So Tuesday, 10 to 10.45, we're at one site, and then 10, you know, 11 to 11.30, we're at another site. We go back to food lane for lunch, and then we go out and do three more sites, and it's a set schedule. January through December. Uh, July through December. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yep. Um, so we would be at the senior center at the same time every week mm -hmm. for about forty-five minutes to an hour. And then you'll you'll be doing Oak Orchard another day, or same, same day? probably same day, like probably right after each okay. other. Yep. So we try to <coughs> make it pretty efficient. If we're going one place, hit two places. Yeah. People at the north end of the village too, I'm sure will be happy to hear Great. about the Oakwood yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah, we had a little bit of trouble. Um, it was up and down with Oak Orchard, so I'd love to figure out ways to cross promote or you know <coughs> use anyone here to be able to promote it because numbers sort of dipped a little bit after the first couple yeah. of weeks. We'll certainly be happy to, to promote it because it's yeah. something that I think villagers would be yeah. very interested in. Definitely. And also connect with the food shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. they can help with it. Yeah. Definitely. They can help each other. Yeah. There's no reason not to. Um, so I guess my question is um, do you guys think the 
senior center over there is it um, would be a strong site. I've never been. Obviously, I still need to go. Um, do people frequent it a lot? I would think so. I mean, Hannah, you could probably speak to that since you've been very involved in the senior center. Have you, have you spoken with the, the uh, building? I haven't personally yet. The guy before me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with a Wednesday, uh, but uh, depends again on the days. Yeah. Because some days are more right. active, but mm -hmm. there certainly are people that are there that come in on the van that would, would welcome right. something like that. Okay. That's good to know. Okay, so okay, sounds um, good. And so Leslie, you will get also mm -hmm. get get ready that the permit the the peddlers. Yep, this was just kind of a first reach out yeah. to see if it was yeah. a worthwhile endeavor yeah. to pursue. <coughs> I think it's great. And then as our schedule develops, I can come to another meeting or um, just stay in touch with everyone. So. We can advertise it on our website too. Yeah, so. it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, final guests of the evening. This is this is unusual to have so many have so many guests, but it's all been very interesting and welcome. Larson Engineers to talk about solar energy for the village. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ram Shivastava. I'm president of Larson <coughs> Engineers. We are a Rochester-based engineering company, and we do a lot of municipal and infrastructure type of work. Arson was started in 55, so we've been around and we've worked with the village of Rockport before. And we serve many other communities. Uh, tonight we're going to have a quick presentation on solar energy. And it is the fastest growing technology and application in the country as far as producing power. And what has made it it happened in New York State is the commitment to switch to cleaner form of energy. So solar energy is really something that requires daylight. Uh, you will find that based on our climate condition, quantity of energy changes, and our slide presentation will sort of give you an overview. Uh, basically, any consumer that consumes power is now in New York State allowed to make their own power and it could be done on your own property, uh, residences, commercial, or somewhere else. And with the help of the tax credits and grants, uh, anybody who consumes power, you pay a charge called systems benefit charge. So it's on your electric bill, SBC charge. That's a tax that you pay to New York State. It goes into a fund that an agency manages, and that money can only be used by giving grants and funding for the energy projects. They can't take this energy fund and build roads with it. It has to be given back as energy conservation. So if you've heard of light bulb changes and saving energy by switching light bulbs to more efficient or more efficient equipment, or in this case, making power. It could be wind, solar, any green energy. And it's all driven by the concern for climate change. Uh, we all know things are happening in extreme events are happening more often than they were supposed to. So this is just basically uh, sharing with you ideas how Village of Brockport could look at their own facilities and take advantage of it if that's something that you want to do. So this is more educational and informational. And with that, I can then introduce Ben Le and the fever who is basically showing the slides, they happen to be on the back side, so folks may have to just turn around and let me go from here. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that, it's in the back, and I had a little trouble getting it going there, but Dan's going to give me a hand. So um, I'm Ben Freebert, and I work for, for Rahm and Larson Engineers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, solar energy and the potential for uh, the village to, to go solar. And the first thing I'd like to say is that now is a really good time to, to go solar. There's a lot of public support for it uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, there's, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, funding available, uh, both state, state level subsidies and uh, some funding available at the federal level and some mechanisms to make those uh, federal level uh, funding uh, opportunities available for tax exempt uh, entities. It's a little tricky, but um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, as we go forward. Dan? 
so the first thing uh, that you might be thinking is solar in New York, really? It's, it's, uh, it's cloudy and rainy here a lot. Does this really work? Well, um, this map, uh, this comes from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And the color coding there uh, tells us where there's the greatest solar resource and, and the relative solar resource across the United States. Uh, solar resource is just a fancy way of saying sunlight. Um, and you see the scale at the bottom tells you what the color coding means. Uh, but to, to uh, make that very brief, New York gets about 65% of the sunlight that the best places in the desert southwest get. Uh, and for another point of reference, in the lower right there is Germany. And Germany gets about 45% of what the desert southwest gets. And I don't know if you know this, but in, in Germany they have implemented a lot of solar photovoltaic uh, systems and uh, something on the order of 25 gigawatts, which is a lot of energy. Uh, so uh, New York gets about 60 to 65% of what they do in the desert southwest, but there are some ways of offsetting the fact that we get less sunlight. First of all, um, solar PV systems continue to generate electricity even on cloudy days. On a really dark overcast day, uh, a solar PV system might generate about 25% of what it would do on a full sunny day. So partly cloudy can be anything in between, really. Um, the other thing is that because we're farther north, uh, when, we, when we mount solar PV uh, panels, we mount them at a, at a steeper angle than would be in the desert, desert southwest. And that steeper angle, combined with uh, rain and snow, uh, help to keep the panels clean. Uh, dust and, and dirt builds up on the panels, and keeping them clean is very important. In the desert southwest, by contrast, they get a fair amount of dust setting on the, on the panels, and they either pay a production penalty, they don't get as much energy, or they have to pay to clean the panels in a place where there's not a lot of extra water. So, to some extent, rain and snow help us here in New York. Uh, I so, buying, not, buying. <laughs> <laughs> not after this winter. Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. This is a tough time of year to sell that concept. But, um, so what we do is we try to look very closely to see if that uh, if a solar PV system might be cost effective for you, uh, given the specifics of your situation, how much energy you use, and what you're paying for electricity. So. Um, Next slide, Dan. So the first thing we want to do is talk a little bit about where your electricity comes from. Because this isn't, when you look at your bill, it's not always evident. I don't know if you look closely at your, at your electric bill, but sometimes I find that terribly frustrating. Now I've looked at a lot of bills, and I'm much better at it. So um, first, your, the power is generated at some sort of a commercial power generation facility. A natural gas plant, I think 36% of the electricity in New York comes from natural gas. Maybe 30% uh, from hydroelectric just under 20% uh, from coal. Uh, I'm getting the numbers Thank next up. Um, but only 3.5% comes from, um, from uh, renewable energy sources other than hydroelectric. So very small amount from wind and, wind and, and solar and those kinds of things. Um, next, it's transmitted over transmission lines and, and through the electrical system that you see uh, um, along the roadway and to your electric meter. <coughs> All of that costs uh, costs money. I mean, it, it, there's resistive losses and there's maintaining all of that system. So that's what you see when you look at your power bill. And if you hit the, hit the button again, you'll see there's a separation between the supply and the delivery. So when you look at your bill, you, you often will see supply, uh, supply charges and delivery charges separated out. And that's, that's where those red boxes sort of delineate where, what those things mean. <clears throat> but at any rate, the, the cost associated with all of that is what shows up on your electric bill. So. Uh, if you hit the next slide, Dan, this chart shows uh, what we anticipate the cost of electricity to do over the next 30 years. So this is a 30-year projection, and this is showing an increase, on average, of 3% per year. The lower line shows 2.7%, and the upper line shows 33 And that's because I don't know for sure that it's going to increase at 3%. At 3% but hit the histor history shows that it increases at about 3% a year. So. All of the white area underneath of the line there, that's the amount of money you'll pay for electricity over the next 30 years. And if you hit the slide again. Uh, so if you implement a solar PV system, and this is but one of the many ways of paying for a solar PV system, this is a power purchase agreement. That yellow line that goes two-thirds of the way across there, that, uh, that is a power purchase agreement. Uh, and with a power purchase agreement, a third party will own the system, 
they'll uh, build it on, possibly build it on your property and rent that bit of property from you in order to build the system on uh, that parcel. And then they'll charge you for the electricity. And you can see that it's below the grid rate that I showed there. And that's by design. When we, when we put these projects together, we tell the developers that will offer a power purchase agreement that it's got to be below what they're paying now because you don't want to see your electricity bill go up for the next 20 years. So it's got to be below the grid rate. And then after 20 years, you own the system. And then beyond the 20 years, uh, you, you are paying a much lower rate for electricity. You're only paying the operations and maintenance costs associated with the solar PV system. So all of the green area now represents savings, the savings that you would see under this particular scenario. Now, there are a lot of assumptions that have gone into this that don't have anything to do with your specific situation. But uh, the point of the chart like this is that we look very closely at the numbers and develop a, a, a projection like this for your situation in particular. Um, so if you hit the button one more time, this shows just a variation on that power purchase agreement. One of the things that we've encouraged our clients to do is to, is to include in the power purchase agreement language and one or more options to buy that system at a nearer time frame. This just shows an example of purchasing the system 10 years after uh, it's implemented. And at 10 years, it's worth about, generally worth about 20% of what it was when it was new. You'll pay fair market value, and that's built into the language. But the estimate is that it's, it's, it's worth about 20% uh, uh, of what it was when it was new. So the additional, you see the additional green area now under the yellow line, that's additional savings. And that's why we recommend that you build some options in there to buy it at, at a future point in time. And when you get to those options, it's an option. You can either choose to do it or pass on that and we'll wait to the next option. Um, so this kind of a projection shows you, uh, will, sh will help to show you what those kinds of options might be worth. And we evaluate uh, the savings, all of that green area, in today's, uh, today's dollar values, net present value. So you can see some numbers in a, in a uh, table there, uh, and it's not necessarily important what those specific numbers are. But but the point is that one of the things that we do is look very closely at the value in today's dollars so you can compare apples to apples. Not only with the power purchase agreement and the buyout, but if you hit the button again, Dan, uh, this is a scenario where you might actually uh, own the system and finance it. Uh, one of the financing options right now is through the New York Power Authority, and I think that the numbers that I plugged in here to build this came from the New York Power Authority's uh, one half of 1% interest rate at the moment. So th their financing terms are very good. At any rate, uh, we'll generate a projection like this for a finance, owned and financed system as well, again showing net present value so you can compare apples to apples and see uh, you know, how, how the savings works out for uh, the village. I, I guess I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say we need to spend too much time on those numbers that I maybe spent too much already, but the financial projection is a bit challenging and, and we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that that's uh, as accurate as it can be. The other thing, in addition to saving money on your electric bill, a uh, solar PV system can help you to, to take control of uh, your electricity costs. So you're shielding yourself uh, somewhat from uh, the cost increases that you might see on the grid. Um, if, if we see more frequent and more severe storms in the future, which that's been forecast by some, um, then that puts the grid at risk, which really is a cost to, to all of us. Uh, things like, um, uh, you've heard about the nuclear power plant in Guinea. My assessment of that is we're going to pay more whether it, they keep it or close it. It's going to cost us more one way or the other. So those kinds of things you, you're shielded somewhat from by uh, implementing your own power generation. Yeah. Uh, this chart shows uh, the, the current and I sort of megawatt block incentive program for small systems. Small systems are less than 200 kilowatts. What I know about your uh, power consumption already is you're bigger than that. And the reason I put this up there is because the, the program for larger systems is not currently open. It was structured completely differently and they closed, they shut that down and now they're uh, on, the, on the cusp of opening this new program for larger systems. Larger systems being from 200 kilowatts up to 2 megawatts. And uh, it's now being structured to look just like the smaller program. So I put the smaller one up there so I can explain how it works and how the, the program for larger systems is going to work. 
Each of those bars represents a block of money. And they, they open the program to applicants to submit for funds under that block of money. And when that amount of money or that amount of kilowatts it expires, when they've had enough applications to consume all of those kilowatts, they move to the next block and so on. They move through all of those blocks. At each block, the dollar figure for your program diminishes. So I think in the small size, uh, right now they're in block four, and that's at 70 cents to 45 cents per watt, depending on the specific size of the system. But the block on the, the chart on the right shows block five, and that goes down to 60 cents or 40 cents per watt. So you can see with as they progress through the blocks, you, the amount of money available for your specific system goes down. So you want to get in as early as possible. Um, Dan? Uh, so what are the steps? I just want to step through the process that we follow to put a project like this in place. First, we look very closely at your, uh, at your electrical usage and, uh, and the price you're paying for electricity. And from that, we can size a solar PV system. And by size, I mean both in terms of the kilowatts that you need, uh, but also in terms of the land space that's required to, to build a system. Um, and then we, we'll come back to you and show you what the uh, resulting financial projection looks like. We take your numbers and put them into those charts that I just went through. And then the next thing that we do, Dan, um, is we look at potential sites, the candidate sites that, that you might have uh, in the village area that um, would be possible to put a solar PV system on. We look for, to make sure it's big enough. We look to make sure it's not shaded or too shaded. We look to make sure that the most, almost, the most important thing is to look at the electric lines to make sure that there's capacity on the nearby electric lines to connect a solar PV system. Uh, so we go through a number of steps of analyzing candidate sites and help to, to make sure we're putting it in the right uh, place. Uh, and the next thing we do is put together a competitive bid process to get a developer. Uh, the developer is if you go with a PPA, an installer if you go with a different financing arrangement. So we competitively bid that to select someone to actually do the project for you, to build it. <coughs> And then we'll perform the, the seeker analysis, the environmental steps, the permitting, um, and provide construction support, engineering and administrative support through the construction of the, of the project. And the final bullet there is to assist uh, with other solar initiatives in the community. And Dan, if you hit the button, you'll see some of those. The Unified Solar PV Permitting, uh, there's $2,500 available from NYSERDA if you want to do that. that. What that does is it puts permitting into the, the villages process so that residents and business owners could put a solar PV system uh, on their business or their home and the permitting process is, is unified. So it's like other permitting processes that are used in other communities. Uh, it's standardized and it helps, it helps you to adopt a process for allowing residents to put a PV system in place. Um, and then there's an, uh, also $2,500 available for EV charging station policies. That's to put Again, to put policies in place so that residents, uh, people who might own electric vehicles, can put an EV charging system in, whether it's their own charging uh, station at their home or business, or a, a public charging station for people who own electric vehicles. The Solarize program, there was uh, briefly a um, program open that offered $5,000 to implement a Solarize program. The Solarize program is a, an effort to competitively select uh, installers to build solar PV systems for businesses and residents uh, and to take advantage of some economies of scale to, to make sure that uh, if there are a number of uh, business owners or residents in the community that want to do solar, they can use their buying power as a group to, to get better pricing on, on solar. That program is closed right now, but I think, I have a suspicion that it, that will open again. It's been successful in a number of other communities and I think we'll see potentially see money available for that in the future. In addition, this sort of begins to paint the picture uh, about NYSERDA putting monies out there for grant monies for communities to move toward more solar in the community. And I think the more of these things that you tend to pursue, the better your position for these programs in the future. There will be more of these types of programs coming from, from NYSERDA. Um, so, this could help to put you in a leadership position within the community to lead the community toward doing more with solar energy and renewable energy and for not only the village to become uh, uh, net, net zero energy consumption, 
uh, but for others in the community to do so also. O often what's needed is for somebody within the community to really take the ball and get this started, to see that uh, it saves people money and, and uh, can move the community in that direction. <coughs> Dan? <clears throat> One place that this has happened, and you may have heard of this, is in Williamson. Um, in December, Williamson flipped a switch on a 1.5 megawatt solar PV system that was built on their landfill. Uh, I think you guys maybe have the landfill as a potential <coughs> to the site that you live very close. There's some particular challenges with building a landfill, but there is also the fact that you're not going to do anything else with the land. It's, it's pretty hard to do, build anything else there. Uh, this project uh, uh, was successful, and we helped to get this uh, off the ground. We did those, went through that process that I highlighted to, to put the Williamson um, system in place. <clears throat> Another program that I wanted to touch on is microgrids. There's currently a uh, competitive process uh, program in place from NYSERDA to implement microgrids. And a microgrid is a, uh, currently now, if you put a PV system in and the power goes down, that PV system has to shut off. So you don't have power when the grid goes down. With a microgrid, that changes that scenario. And the microgrid is more than just a single house or business or building remaining powered when the power goes out, but possibly a greater community uh, and the um, particularly the critical infrastructure in the community, hospitals or emergency services or law enforcement or whatever municipal buildings you deem uh, critical infrastructure could remain powered through a microgrid system. So that those those kinds of things being um, available in New York State, are, it's, that's kind of new. And that program that's currently underway is trying to, to, to determine how well that can work and uh, how to get past some of the technical issues. Um, but again, this is another program that's in place that I wanted to point out because New York is moving very rapidly toward these kinds of, of programs uh, to advance solar energy wind energy, renewable energy, storage systems, so that communities can be more resilient against power outages. Next steps. What are the next steps? Well, um, uh, I think the next steps are for you to help you to go through those that process that I highlighted so that uh, you can take advantage of the uh, nice sort of funding in, its, in earlier blocks rather than later blocks of funding so that you get more um, more money for a solar PV uh, project. Um, as I've been working on, on these projects, what I've discovered is they're terribly complicated. <laughs> the funding is complicated, the rules at NYSERDA are changing, the rules concerning net metering and remote net metering, that's having a solar PV system built over here and having it provide the power for buildings that are not co-located. Um, those rules are changing and they're kind of tricky to keep up with. So, um, yeah, it, it's complicated, and I think uh, having help to, to put a project like that in place is, is really critical to be efficient and to move it forward quickly. And with that, I guess I would ask if there are questions about what we're on. I've got one with, you, you came in, and Harry and I met with you and talked with you about this. So one of the things sure. you mentioned was that, that this was not a capital project. In other words, it... Can you elaborate on that a bit about you know how it's paid for? Yes. Um, so with the, there are two. There are two prime. It could be a capital project if you wanted it to, <laughs> but I don't think you want that. <laughs> and that's why that's why I brought that up when I was here before. So uh, the two currently the two paths that we see that involve no capital expenditure on the village's part. First is a power purchase agreement, and with the power purchase agreement, as I mentioned, a third party actually owns the system and you might put it on your land, potentially the landfill, and they would have to lease that land from you at a nominal, you know, at a nominal price. And uh, so because they own the system, they can take advantage of the federal investment tax credits, and then they charge you for the power. So you go from uh, paying uh, your utility to paying the developer for the same electricity. Uh, you remain connected to the utility, so you still have to pay something to the utility. Those things that you can't offset with a solar PV system, like the customer charge and any demand charges. But um, and with the guarantee the solar... is that you're paying less. Yes, yes. In fact, if it doesn't, <laughs> if it doesn't work out, then you know that 
in my mind, by default, that means the project doesn't go forward. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, those charts, those charts um, that I showed before, we would necessarily come to you with ones that show mm -hmm. you pay less, equal to or less tomorrow than what you're paying. And your costs are covered through through whichever option we would go through, or is that? Uh, yeah, that? yes, mm -hmm. yes. So our costs, will, the way we work, operate this is we ask for a, a small fee up front. $2,500 to cover getting us started and getting going, which covers some of getting us started if you're getting going. And then we build into the project our, our engineering fee, which is not unlike an engineering fee that you'd see on any other municipal project. It's not out of line in terms of the percentage. We build that into the cost of the project so that it's, it's financed through however you finance the project, whether it's the PPA or the other option was the, the not NICA funding, that's the New York Power Authority. And uh, this is another one of those things that's pretty complicated and it's changing. But the New York Power Authority, um, that's, those are public funds that they're making available back to the public to, uh, to public entities to build projects like this. And um, that, uh, that debt doesn't show up on your books, they carry it on their books. And they have mechanisms to make uh, the project uh, see some of the benefits of the federal investment tax credit and federal uh, accelerated depreciation components. So, um, and, and as I mentioned, the interest rate is very low on that. They adjust the interest rate every year, but our recent conversations with them has led us to believe that it never gets above one percent. So that's pretty good financing. Again, but that's the other scenario that doesn't require a capital outlay from the village. Other questions? Yes, sir. The power that's generated, is that actually we sell it to the utility to buy it back? Is that correct? Uh, I mean, we're not worried directly to this, so. Uh, so it's connected to the grid. Your, your system is connected to the grid that's yes. through agreement with your utility. And um, you are credited. This is tricky because the rules are changing. So under the old rules, you're credited dollars based on how much energy the solar PV system uh, generates at the meter where the solar PV system is. And then you get to use those dollars at all of the other meters where you have facilities. Right. Under the new, and I think about to be rescinded rules, you get credit based on kilowatt hours that are generated at the PV system, and you can use the kilowatt hours at all of your meters. That's different because not all meters have the same rate. Okay. So, the uh, price of yeah. the price of uh, producing electricity today, especially with gas, has reduced substantially. Has that had an effect on the, any of your equations? Um, it has not. And the reason for that is that um, we look at the price of electricity on the grid. And uh, it, our, our projection is that that's going to continue to go up at about 3% per year. Those, those blips that happen um, because of, of a reduction in the price of gas uh, first, they don't always get passed on to electric utility customers, and they're generally, you know, that kind of thing has generally been short term. So there is there is a potential that you would see in the next five years or ten years or thirty years. You know, this is a very long term projection because solar PV systems last a long time. There's a potential that the price of electricity on the grid would go down. I don't personally think that's very likely. The other question is. You mentioned it will last a long time. What is, how long are these cells or units good for? When is so, it to be replaced? Yeah. So um, the, the panels, the modules, uh, are warranty, guaranteed for 25 years. And uh, there are plenty of systems in place uh, past 30 years. So they last a long time. What happens is... Who warrants them? Uh, the manufacturer warrants them for 25 years. What are they on around? Uh, well, that's, if they're not that. around, that's a problem. Yeah, it is. However, when we put the project together, that's one of the things we ask for from, from a potential developer is, you know, you've got to pick panels that are from a reputable company that's been around. That's one of the things we try to make sure. One of the steps that we do in the, in the, uh, in the RFP and developer selection process is to help, very much help analyze the responses that you get and advise you on, on who gets a lot. There are many issues out there with manufacturing, with the Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, 
there are some issues out there like that, and we're we're trying to stay attuned to that. Again, that's another component of this market that's changing very rapidly. You know, there's new manufacturers prop, cropping up, and uh, prices that's affecting the prices significantly. And keep an eye on that is 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 challenging. But there are also a lot of reputable manufacturers of solar panels, and they're in the competitive market. And it's you know, prices on panels from reputable manufacturers are coming down very rapidly. Too. I wanted to just add a little bit. You probably will be using panels made in Buffalo, New York. That's where yeah. the big plant is from Solar City. None from Brockport. <laughs> <laughs> Open up an area. They might. There are four or five thousand dollar, uh, four or five thousand dollar, uh, four or five thousand jobs being started there. A huge drop. Brownfield site that they got Solar City to come in. The Buffalo Billion, their governor provided to bring new jobs and whatnot. But this whole idea of, you say, how long do they last? You would imagine that, okay, after 30 years, they're dead. But in solar business, 30 years later, if they're making 80% of the power they made when they were brand new, that's what they're talking about. So there are panels which are in Germany because they were the ahead of the curve in designing, building. There's still solar <coughs> systems operating at 80% level producing that much power. So they are pretty rugged, solid state technology. The part where you have maintenance costs are the, they call them inverters, the thing which converts the power from DC to AC. They are warranted for 15 years. So when we look at the charge for maintenance, we keep some money aside to pay for a brand new inverter 10, 15 years from now. And this is a long-term decision. The solar power is giving you an opportunity to get into it with somebody else's capital up front, buy it after 10 years, and then for the next 30 years it will make power for two or three cents a kilowatt hour. And you're better than Fairport Electric uh, or any other municipal power in that zone. So when you see the curve, the savings are bigger later, that's your saving to invest in the community. So you get into it for the long term solution. What about thinking about putting solar panels on a landfill, which Williamson has, has done, which if we were to do it, we might do. What about security <coughs> issues? I mean, this is a pretty expensive piece of construction. How do you uh, secure it? Well, um, I think in Williamson, there's simply the fence around. Fence and the cameras. And so that so mm -hmm. sort of requires that there be a fence around it. Okay. Um, to the extent that you think that's not enough, then you could easily add more to that. For instance, these systems uh, self, they monitor themselves. The electronics in the inverters monitor the system to see if it's producing electricity. So if it's a bright sunny day and whoever you have monitoring the system, uh, in the first, if you go to PPA, the first 20 years, that's the developer, he's monitoring the system. Uh, if it quits working, they know immediately and they go fix it. You can connect to that sort of technology. There would have to be communication technology to the PV system in order for that to work. So you can connect right up to that technology with cameras and and do some uh, additional monitoring that way to, uh, as a security measure. Any other questions? So the upfront cost of the village, at all, is it all interesting? Is $2,500 just to... Yes, and there's something I left out about the $2,500, and that is that we reimburse that back to you when we get okay. into the project and, mm -hmm. and collect our fee to the, the developer. <laughs> Actually, I find that a little frustrating because it is. It's hard to sell things to people when, they're, when it's stupid to be true. Like, we, we've got to find a way of making this not sound for people. Yeah, it, it is because it is because both at the federal level and the state level, they're really trying to move this. They're trying to get more solar deployed uh, because it does a lot of things in terms of moving us away from dependence on foreign oil, uh, resiliency. Uh, for, for for climate change and, and, and uh, the associated more frequent and more severe storms that are being predicted with that. So. And there's developers out there who are willing to take on a project like this. They they will be competing for your for your project. I mean, we yes. put, we put it out to we, we will put the RFP for a, such a project out to multiple developers and and we'll get numerous bids to to compete to build. Oh, yeah. There's a significant difference when you do the competitive procurement because you may have a several hundred thousand dollar difference between first, top, or lower. And you're making long-term commitments, so it's important to check 
you're getting good quality product and good co contractors. Mm -hmm. That would be part of your job. That's what we salt on that as well. Mm -hmm. We cannot submit the application. You cannot submit the application. It has to be submitted by a solar installer approved by a funding agency. So we have to compete, uh, let them compete and get the business. Mm -hmm. You said that the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, these agreements or whatever were for the larger systems or the programs for the larger <coughs> systems are not currently open, but you anticipate they will be soon? But very soon. So we have been hearing since uh, fall that they would be open uh, at the end of the first quarter of 2015, which is coming up now. <laughs> For all practical purposes, is now. Yeah. And I had heard recently from a contact that it was March 27th, but she later said, "No, I'm not. I'm not positive it's March." Well, the budget so passes on that. April 1, and yeah. after that, the, everybody yeah. starts working. So. And, and this is fairly uh, common, common knowledge in the solar industry that this program is going to be opening. So. There are a lot of people doing just what we're doing. Let's get these projects ready. Mm -hmm. So I anticipate when they open the, the program that they're going to get a, a flood of applications and then they'll be okay for a while. And, and all that will likely happen in the first block. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a little time to, to get a project together that's in the first block. But even if it moves to the second block, you still want to be prepared to get an application as soon as possible. So you would recommend that we meet with you again soon? Uh, that's what I would recommend, but again, I'm selling services, yeah. so you, you know, right. uh, I think you have to go through so your to. due diligence yeah. and your process to make sure that's what you want to do. And if you want to visit the site in Williamson, we can, we can arrange that trip, yeah. let the weather go, get a little better. Are there other places that, Scottsville, yeah. Scottsville is is currently working Scott, on this, right? Scottsville is currently working on a project. Uh, the town of Rush is currently working on a but project. But they aren't up and running yet? They're, those aren't up and running, but there are some others that are, that you're familiar with. Um, there are two other solar PV systems. If you just want to see large solar, you could go to Bosch and Lom in Rochester. There's a huge megawatt size in their factory behind it. So there are lots of... This. Were you involved in there? No, not on that, that project. But we did the first project about five years ago for the village of Medina. <coughs> we have a wastewater plant which has solar panels. They have a DPW building in Medina which has solar panels. So operating. you did that project? Yeah. So those are operating before this program. Mm. And then town of Williamson and the town hall library have a solar system which was built before the landfill system and their sewage treatment plant. Village of Lyons sewage plant. These are all municipal projects. Mm -hmm that were grants available at the time of the stimulus funding. So these villages applied and they made their sewage plant produce their own power in a way, some power there. So they are operating and they are all Larson projects, but the bigger one, bigger size is the Williams that we just finished. And it takes a long time, a year and a half, back and forth. How long? From start to running? Well, there were a lot of learning curve for the utility, for so it was more like uh, initial planning may take six, seven months, but once the project is approved, in five or six months you're done. So you're talking a year yeah. to get it up and running? Yes. Well, we have a virtual <coughs> workshop next week. Um, I think it's something that we could continue to have a discussion on there and then get back to you. I have a really untechnical question, but this building um, is kind of in need of some roof repairs from what the board has talked about. Can the solar panels be put on this building instead of re-roofing it? Is that, can, does it take the place of a roof? So there, it, it does not take the place of a roof. Um, uh, there are some uh, issues that you would want to look into if you were considering putting solar on this building. First is structural. Will it handle the Okay. And the second is, does it generate enough power, uh, the amount of power that you want? And if you want to just have a solar PV system on the roof of this building, you could certainly build one up there. My guess is that it would not, there's just not enough roof space to provide all of the power for even for this gotcha. building. Uh, and if you look at all of the facilities that you have, then you're looking at a much a need for a much bigger area. That's why we look at uh, a, a ground mountain system, okay. such as possibly the land. I was just thinking to kill two yeah. birds with one stone. Yeah. Yeah. Smart <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not, it's not bad. It, it, so if, if, you, if you were to 
uh, consider maybe putting solar panels on this building and building something elsewhere uh, as a ground mount system like at the landfill, you start to get into some complications with the rules surrounding remote net meter. So we have to be very careful about that. It's much easier to build all of the panels and put all the panels in one place, ground mounted, connect it to the grid, use the <coughs> remote net metering rules to your advantage, and provide power to all of your facilities. So. Yeah, just municipal power. Yeah. Okay, not just for the building, it's for the whole village. For is it? It would be the, for the for municipal. the buildings, but then we also did talk about the issue of lights, which are owned by National Grid. And what Scottsville's doing? Are they not buying back their mm -hmm. lights from on their main street? Street lighting, and, yeah. And yeah. remote metering those for. Okay. But so this is for municipal owned buildings. Yes. Yes. Okay. The rule is that the generator and consumer must be the same entity. So you're making power, the meter is in your name, yeah. you're using power, the meters are in multiple locations in your name. So okay. you can swap the generation and consumption that way. Okay. Okay, thank you. thank you very Thanks, much. Thank you. Thank you. Be in touch. Yep. Okay, on to consensus items. So, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the March 2nd meeting? I need to approve as a minor correction. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'll second it. Second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Motion carries with one abstention. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the bills? Second. For a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Clerk report, mostly. Okay, uh, a couple things that weren't on the agenda. Today the Monroe County check came in for a little over $68,000 um, to uh, make the village whole on the 2014 unpaid village taxes. If you remember, I explained when we did the tax surrender in November that then the county always puts it on the town and county taxes in January and then they reimburse us in March, and March or April. So it came in kind of early. And that was 68000 A little over 68000 yep. So we've been made whole. Those that didn't pay their 2014 village taxes, um, we've been made good on it and the county continues to follow up with them. Uh, also, uh, today I finished up the annual insurance application. Thank you to uh, the police department and the Department of Public Works for their help reviewing our vehicle schedule and, and the things that go into that. Um, it was a little bit easier this year because it's renewing with nine year rather than starting uh, one year. I had to do probably six different insurance carriers applications and it was a bit of a nightmare. So. A renewal application is much easier, so um, that's done, and we're awaiting results on that. And then uh, my first agenda item, any sidewalk cafe permits submitted. There hadn't been anything at the time of the packet, but in uh, today's mail, I emailed the board this afternoon, Perry's Pizza at 82 Main Street, did put in an application and would like their application considered. Um, Pretty much same as last year, except they're asking for an increase in the hours on certain nights of the week, um, which the board can take into consideration. And they wanted those hours extended to 3 a.m. Thursday yeah. through... The village code allows sidewalk cafe permits from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. They want it open until 3 a.m. Thursday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. And they put and the write-up why they believe it warrants that. Um, that's something for the board to consider. If you do, you'll have to offer the same to anyone else. Do you want sidewalk cafes in the middle of the night? We could, but we could discuss it. We could discuss it here. I mean, I think there's... Seeing that, the it, wasn't on, huh? seeing that it wasn't on the agenda, can we just take that as... We, we could, but... Um, the, it was on the agenda, but the, this application just came in. The application came yeah. in. I mean, let's discuss it, and then we can decide if we want to, if we want to, if we want to table it. Um, I'd like to hear what the reasoning is. Yeah. I, I can read what I sent you by email this afternoon. 
um, for the Thursday through Saturday. I realize that it is after 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. when when classes are in session. However, it has been proven that the tables and chairs outside keep the college students seated and behaved. I have taken photos of the students without tables and chairs and it makes it worse when they're not sitting. It also helps keep the shop less crowded and is less of a fire hazard when there are tables available outside for them to sit at. Please consider these safety issues when reviewing the application. I think this opens a can of worms, frankly. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it sounds logical, but you have apartments above all of those places, you open up this up for one person, you're going to have burrito fresco with tables out there till 3 o'clock in the morning and everybody else. And, uh, you know, if, if people are hanging around in front of something, I mean, that might be the police department might suggest they disperse if they're making a lot of, you know, a lot of noise. I, I, think, it's, I think it's problematic. Yeah. I agree. I think they should keep their business indoors after 11 o'clock. I agree. And if I could just make a rec recommendation to the board, since it is something that is in the zoning ordinance, it would be something that they could apply for a variance okay. for. Um, so that wouldn't be something that the, that the village board could just say they're, they're, they're okay to do it. They would have to apply for a variance for it. Okay. That Even though the board... Mm -hmm. Um, because it is exempted that other section about how much of the cycle they could use it, uh, unless they unless they put a moratorium on, on the entire sidewalk cafe portion of the zone ordinance mm -hmm. um, but since it is in the zone ordinance it's something that a variance would have to be obtained for if they wanted okay. to so vary from that, and that portion would be of the use variance? yes so that would yeah that sounds like a good way to handle it to just tell them they have to Okay. Is there any um, comment from DPW or the police department concerning it? I think it would be problematic if they're asking for problems. <coughs> I think late at eight, 11 o'clock at night is late enough and they start going up at 2 or 3 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I think it's for Andrew to come out and pay. And they can bring their their business inside, it doesn't mean that they're precluded from having a business. But you also have a noise ordinance, and as you stated, we have people that live up, up above. How do you please say? Do, do we have to approve the application, Melissa? No, you can. You can no, no, but I mean, do we, you do, wish to, do we have to pass a resolution? Oh, yes, if you're ready to, then yes, yeah. it needs a motion of what you're approving. Okay. Yeah. Since obviously we're kind of against this, is there any way that we can make the recommendation to the zoning board? Can the village board make it known to the zoning board what their position on this is? Interesting. Well, if, if we, if we approve the, if we approve the application uh, with the modification that, that it it extends only to 11 p.m. That tells the zoning board. Okay, great. Yeah, and that they, if they wish, they can apply to the zoning board for a variance if they wish. Yes. Can I ask again, Leslie, what, what is the, um, presently, what is the time? Six, uh, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Okay. It sounds, if I understood that uh, uh, comment correctly, they're po positing as uh, the alternatives as being uh, kids standing around outside or kids sitting outside. And it seems to me like the third alternative is they can sit or stand inside. Right, and it sounds like they were saying they're too I, full inside, I, I, so I they end up going outside. I don't think it's reasonable that we could think that they're going to have to move inside. They will continue to mm -hmm. be outside. Especially if the weather I've seen. But I've seen at that time of the day, they are standing outside. Uh, <coughs> by us approving or not approving, doesn't mean they'll be inside. Mm -hmm. but, they'll be outside. But if we leave it the way it is, then we haven't tied the police department's hands to take care of it. They're not going to be able to come back and say, well, we can be here. If we leave it the way it is, come 11 o'clock, if there's still a problem, police can do their job. Does that make sense? Yeah, 
mean, we would we would only approve it till eleven o'clock. Yeah. Well, I thought we were still. Oh no, I think I think that was seemed to be the. Do we need to put? I don't even know if that needs to go into the resolution. But when you when you correspond with them, you can tell them they can apply for a zoning variance from the zoning board. Right. But we don't need to put that in. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve the sidewalk cafe permit? Um, as it stands to, to be, the table's to be out until 11 p.m. Hmm? For parents. For parents, yeah. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Uh, <coughs> wait campaign, uh, just a reminder, I think everybody got, uh, with last week's paychecks, the um, uh, annual campaign is going on for United Way, and uh, Chief Rennie, Deep Good Ideas, Superintendent Donahue, uh, Seymour Library Director Carl Govea, who was here earlier, uh, all joined me in signing a letter to the employees, and uh, we encourage participation, either a one-time check is fine, or payroll deduction. So I'm hoping to increase our numbers there. And good news, again, we, got, we are going to get a refund through our workers' comp reserve plan. I put that information in the packet. Um, kudos to everybody um, for doing a great job with <coughs> workers' comp and loss control and risk control. Um, I think we all, I only had to report two things last year and both of them were medical only. One person, two different incidents, had to be treated medically and we paid some medical bills, no loss work time. Um, so we're really doing very, very well. Um, and Treasurer Hendricks and I had a recommendation in the packet um, about how to utilize that money. And I believe we were rec recommending 50%. Yeah, half of it to our reserve account. We have a workers' comp reserve. It's about 220000 I believe, and this would give us another forty-five, give or take, to mm -hmm. go into that reserve in the event we ever had a you know, large loss. Yeah. And then that leaves the other forty-five or so that could be an unanticipated Goes into the fund, uh, gets into the fund revenue. balance. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're anticipating a nice check of a little over 93000 in May. So do I have a motion from the board to take that workers' comp um, refund and put 50% into the workers' comp reserve and 50% into the general fund? I'll so move. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, department reports. Treasurer Hendricks. Um, we included the uh, financial reports through February, included some uh, budget transfers and amendments. Um, as I say regularly, we're pretty much on track, you know, in, in total. Um, you know, we've got to do some adjusting to clear up some minuses, and there's some transfers that do take care of that. Uh, but, but overall, the village is uh, pretty solid footing. Everything looks, looks pretty good. Um, can't complain too much. <laughs> um, so, if there's any questions about any of that, I'd be happy to try to address those. Otherwise, I can talk about the budget. Okay. The, the budget. Um, just going to do a, a brief update. Um, thank you. Um, as you know, one, one thing that we've talked about um, is related to where are we going to wind up. And uh, the board has made it pretty clear that they'd like to stay within the tax cap, uh, which I've indicated is, is, is doable, which is a 1.68% increase to the tax levy. Um, what that would do would increase the, the levy by about, not about, but $43,000 added to the levy. Um, and what this slide shows you is, the, um, based on the updated assessments uh, for Sweden and Clarkson, um, the actual tax rate itself will go up by about 0.6%, uh, a little over seven cents uh, per thousand. Um, so for a $100,000 house, that'd be a $7 um, increase. Um, the assessments in Sweden are up um, about a percent, and the assessment in Clarkson is, is actually down quite a bit because of the hospital. Um, they reduced their assessment. Um, 
So I was a little surprised when I saw that figure, but it, you know, it's not a big part of the part of the, the levy. They represent 0.3% you know, of the levy. So if we wind up with a budget um, and the revenues work out like I'm expecting, um, that would be where we wind up. On the expenditure side of the budget, this slide is just summarizing um, for the general fund by the various um, account codes, central administration, public safety, public works, uh, et cetera. Um, and the, the bottom line, essentially, we get to about a $100,000 increase in total, or just under 2% in the expense side, 1.94. The, the budget itself that I've given you tonight and we haven't really had a chance to look at, so uh, we, we've updated salary figures, we've updated um, some of the equipment requests. I did include um, some funding uh, in regard to the roof for upstairs. Um, I, I, I increased that budget to 30000 I know that's probably not going to be enough, but at least I want to put some money in there so we can at least get the discussion started as to what we might uh, do. Um, I'm sure there's a few options that we can, you know, we can figure out how we want to proceed depending on how, <clears throat> how important that becomes. Um, but I think overall, if, you know, if we can bring the budget in, um, you know, we, we have had, I've said, be, I've said before, we've had a couple of um, opportunities, I guess I would say, with the fact that the retirement system costs have gone down for next year, and hopefully that will continue for, for a few years because those, those rates, if you know, have gotten up into the stratosphere. Um, so, it, you know, the, their coming down is, is a nice thing to see, and it does certainly help our budget. Uh, health insurance, we're also weak. We're in really good shape on that budget for, for this year. So, um, pretty optimistic about where things are going to wind up. The, the water sewer budgets, we've talked a little bit about. Um, the, the water budget's up about 2.4%. Um, <clears throat> we, we're not recommending a change in rates. Uh, sewer budget's up just about 1%. Um, and we would you know, do the same thing with that. Um, you know, leave that um, where, where it is also as far as the charges. Um, but I just wanted to give a brief update for the community to let you know where we, we, see, we see we're headed and I'm sure over the next few weeks we can go over in more detail um, all of the stuff that we included in the budget. So all the equipment, et cetera, staffing, et cetera. And where, is it, where does it show the tax rate? Um, the tax rate, I, I just did it on the slide. I didn't give you that. I don't think, oh no, it's on the very... The very first page. The, the, yeah, page three, Bill, in your handout. I see it for Sweden and Clarkson, but I don't see it for... Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the village tax rate. It's paid, it's separated by the two towns, but it'll be the village. So if you live in Sweden, your tax rate's going to be 11.8687. If you live in Clarkson, it's going to be 11.8687. The hospital, just the hospital. Just the hospital. There's the hospital. There's uh, RG and E um, has a piece of property um, that they pay taxes on, and there's some other two or three little pieces. That so there's, there's an increase of 0.62 percent. Yes, as well in the the, in the rate. That's the rate. Yeah. Don't get confused by the levy. No. The, the levy is 1.68. Yeah, but the tax rate is what counts for the. No, it's no, the levy. It's the levy. levy. So the levy counts for the cap. Rate. So if you had a lot of assessment, you still growth in assessment, the, that wouldn't help you. So, yeah. so the rate in 2014, the tax rate was $11.80. Right. So it would be $11.80. So we're right, yeah. $11 so we're right on the tax. Right on. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. I just heard on the news about Ronnie Quakes. They were talking about these tax cap of being about 3%? Is it a they different system? Different year? Yeah, I don't know where they got three. Um, okay. Yeah, because we got ours from the, directly comes from the state for our fiscal year. So it could be that, yeah, that surprises me. Three, yeah, I don't know where they get an extra it plus one point. For everybody, I thought it was one point. Well, it depends on your fiscal is, year. It changes. Ours are different because of, we're splitting the year. Yes, oh. yes. But three's high. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Was that the town? I, I believe it was these. Were you on the ship when you were? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. No, uh, I was in Brockport when I came. Nice to bring that. I'll check it out.
I, I just curious. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, one point six eight is it's definitely our number. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The board was going to just decide if, if you notice at the bottom of the agenda it says you, on your budget calendar it says you'd meet on the twenty third with the treasurer regarding the budget if necessary. I'm yeah, I think it's necessary. Okay. We've got to have time to read this and mm -hmm. yes, yeah. digest it. Digest it. Okay, building code enforcement and zoning, David Miller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to keep my report short and sweet. Uh, this week I'm attending my annual training uh, that is required um, by New York State. Um, this, this year is at the RIT and a conference center. Um, a lot of discussion about new codes that are going to be coming out. New York State is, is going to be putting forth their new building code uh, later on this year. Um, and there are some potentially groundbreaking um, changes that may be, may be implemented. Um, as the gentleman had sp spoken about previous, um, New York State is heading towards a, a much greener uh, type of building. Um, so they are going to be pushing ways to make buildings more energy efficient. Um, also, and I'm not going to bore everybody with the, uh, with the particulars, but uh, one big uh, hot topic item that is, is, is on the board that will be up to vote soon is the potential for residential sprinklers in any new build homes. Um, and, and that's a hot topic for um, all fire officials around New York State. Um, there are already other states that have adopted uh, something similar, California included. Um, so that is something that is a real hot topic um, that, that could be implemented in this new, new code that would be, in effect, the first of uh, 2016. Um, there have been some changes recently um, regarding some, some codes that have been implemented early uh, on this year. Um, they've put into effect the new commercial, uh, commercial uh, energy efficiency code. Um, as well as um, requirements for trust identification and, and laminated lumber identification stickers on all new residential um, additions, um, new built homes. Um, if you do any sort of renovations inside uh, your home and going to put in laminated lumber uh, trusses, you now have to have an identification sticker <coughs> placed on your meter box outside your home to let fire officials know that, uh, that there is laminated lumber inside your home. Um, so that has been put into effect as of the beginning of this year. Um, already had a couple of uh, new build homes that have gone up in, in the village of Brockport, put those identification stickers on. Um, so you'll be seeing more of those uh, coming up here soon. Along with that, um, I had to design a form to notify all of, uh, notify the uh, Brockport Fire District as to this address has this type of engineered lumber, uh, please be aware uh, <coughs> that this type of lumber system is, is in these structures. Um, so again, I, I, I won't go into uh, any more, but there are some pretty, um, pretty hefty changes that are going to be coming in. Um, New York State typically adopts their own version of the international code. Um, this code, they won't be doing that. They will actually be adopting the uh, international code with just minor changes to it. Uh, so they won't be, it won't be the New York State building code, it'll be the international code. Um, so some, some pretty big changes coming, coming down the pipeline with the, uh, with the building code. Um, the re residential uh, rental and fire inspections are, are ongoing and continuing. Um, the latest numbers on our rental registrations out of the 363 rental registrations uh, that are due on an annual basis, we are now down to 23 that have not submitted their rental registrations. So uh, that's a, a pretty, pretty uh, exciting number. Uh, I'm very pleased with how this is going. Um, so we'll be uh, moving forward with um, those that have not responded with that now will be moving forward into the, uh, into the court process and that will be submitted to the uh, Village of Rockport Code here, or Village of Rockport Court soon. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's my report. Thank you.
Chief Randy. Good evening. Uh, I, I will go uh, very quickly. We received a letter uh, from AAA uh, in June. Mayor, you've attended uh, last year. You went with me for the crossing guard breakfast. The AAA. No, I didn't go. I'm sorry. You didn't go. No. I was never going to give I you. I was that. invited. I wasn't <laughs> going to give you. A, you weren't invited. I was. No, I oh, was. you were. Yeah. Go. Okay. Um, well, in my mind, you were there. So, anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. It's a good breakfast. <laughs> it was breakfast, correct. This year we will be presented with the Platinum Award. The Brockport Police Department has uh, achieved a, a, a level of success which is, uh, qualifies us for the highest award. So we received notification from AAA on that. That will be handed out in June. Um, over the last month, uh, myself, Mr. Andrews, and yourself, Mayor, uh, attended the Stop DWI luncheon where officers uh, Cranston, Sang, Saratori, Dawson, and Hagen all received uh, Stop DWI awards for one reason or another. Uh, we also received the Small Police Department Award in Monroe County. There's a small, medium, and large. We received the Small uh, Police Department Award for the greatest uh, number of increases in DWI arrests. Um, and I believe we're going to continue to see those go up. It's unfortunate, I guess that's the bad news, is that people continue to drive drunk. Uh, the good news is um, we will uh, continue to arrest those that we catch. Interestingly, I, I don't know if, because I know you had another meeting and you had to leave, but one of the most important things that I found that came out of this meeting, or this luncheon, uh, for the public to hear, and I think it's important, is that uh, they had a presentation because it is a training session. We were here for that. Okay. Yeah, and um, at the training session, uh, the officer uh, did a training module on what you would think would be drunken driving. Uh, in fact, he showed a, a clip of a vehicle going down the road and weaving from one side to the other, bouncing off a curb and eventually hitting the curb, overturning and implanting the vehicle uh, into a tree. And, of course, we're all there watching this saying, okay, well, that's, that's obviously a drunk driver. You're at a DWI seminar. And it wasn't. It was a driver that was texting. And uh, the uh, Governor's Traffic Safety Board has done a study on people that text. And they've come out with an equation that texting equals a particular percentage of, of what a, a person that would be drinking would equal. And I would venture to say that if I asked anyone in this room, I don't think anyone would believe that when you're texting, it's equivalent to your blood alcohol level being 0 0.08, which is the legal limit, in the, which is the cutoff limit in New York State. So if, if you're texting while driving, that's equivalent to driving drunk. Um, we are going to continue to enforce the texting laws. I would ask that each and every person do their best to promote uh, not texting and driving, um, and uh, I guess that's the, the most I'll say about that. I've also disseminated a fourth quarter report and a yearly report uh, to the board prior to tonight's meeting. I don't know if there's any questions on that, but those both went out to the board. And then lastly, uh, this will be the last time I speak of, of overtime until such time that we uh, are at full staffing, which will be in June. I think we've made our point that a lot of money continues to uh, be used to backfill in overtime. Uh, Leslie, I forwarded you the reports that I have for, for your uh, records. Um, and we will re-examine this again in June uh, and we'll have enough of a, of a comparison to be able to do that. But uh, just to synopsize, to give an executive summary if I may, from December 14th through February 21st, if you were to back out uh, any training hours that were used because training was higher than ever before because of the recruits that we had in the academy, so that's an anomaly. If you were to back out any grant money that was expended, because again, that's not taxpayer money uh, from the village of Rockport. And if you were to back out any backfilling of overtime, we uh, incurred 78 hours of overtime from December 14th through February 21st. If you were to compute that over the course of 26 pay periods, that would come out to roughly 400 hours of overtime or about $20,000. Um, now that's the best case scenario. 
So I'm very comfortable with what we've budgeted at this point, which is $50,000 in overtime. And I'm confident that you'll see these numbers reflect that uh, in June once the recruits are off FTO. The last comment I'll make is that you will see uh, the new recruits on the road now. You'll see uh, whether it be at night, in the afternoons, or in the morning, uh, some cars riding two uh, officers in the vehicle. That would be one FTO officer and then one of our two uh, newest recruits. They're doing well. Um, they're uh, very wide-eyed, seeing an awful lot of different things. Uh, one of the recruits uh, was exposed to a, uh, a forcible rape in the first degree investigation the first week he was here. Uh, so that kind of opened his eyes to some of the things that we do investigate. And uh, he did a nice job with the amount of exposure that we allowed him to have to that case. <coughs> we said, we're not going to take a rookie and just throw him into a, an investigation of that magnitude. But he, for what he was exposed to, he did a very nice job. The other uh, uh, rookie, if you will, is also doing a good job, and uh, you will see them periodically throughout the village. Mayor, just a, a quick question. Did you have a different take on that? Uh, what, the presentation? Yeah, I mean, no, with the, it's, with no. the texting? Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I mean, to me, it was, it was a fascinating presentation and very sobering, if you will. They, they quoted two different things. One was for cell phone use, and I thought that was 0.08, and I thought the texting was 0.18, because they gave two, two different figures for... I'll double it's check. Yeah, I, I, I asked for that to be sent to us. Yeah. I'll forward it to the board. It I'll made the point anyway. I mean, it was, it was quite... Well, it's expensive. either bad or real bad. Either yeah. way, it's very high. It's not good either way. Not good. That's all I have. Excuse me, Chief. When will the new recruits be off training, finished with training? June. June? Yes, sir. Uh, and that's pursuant to New York State accreditation standards and such like that. But they'll go back to the academy and then they'll ultimately graduate and then be on their own. So June will be the time frame that um, if all things go well, they'll, they'll be done, which I suspect they will. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Trustees. I just got a couple of quick things. Uh, I'd like to set the uh, dates for the spring hydrant flushing, um, and we'll get those posted in the paper for the Bard's blessing. Uh, be Monday, April 3rd, north of the canal, both the east and west side of Main Street. Tuesday, April 14th, south of the canal, all items on the east side of Main Street. And Wednesday, south of the canal, all items on the west side of Main Street. 